Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I'm ecstatic. My supporters are ecstatic. And I'm looking forward to becoming a justice on August 1st, and I'm happy to take your questions. How do you feel comfortable declaring victory when the margin is so thin? Certainly Justice Prosser's supporters seem to think that they may be able to still pull out a victory in a recount process. You know, we ran a campaign that was focused on being positive and respectful and, and, and winning, and we did win, and we're confident that the margin will hold. Why do you feel that way? Because we've enjoyed a broad and deep statewide support, and we're gratified that the numbers show that. But I mean, in terms of the, the counting, you know, uh, many of the observers say that with a vote count that's this close, that could be one adding error in one county that's making up the difference. Why do you feel that that vote count is so reliable at this point in time? You know, the numbers show that we won, and we are gratified to have that victory in hand. Have you talked to Justice Prosser? I have not talked to him yet, but I'm looking forward to talking to him. Yes, um, the unions were a very substantial part of your support in winning this election. Do you feel comfortable as a justice then ruling on the cases that will involve unions? You know, I was supported by the thousands of individuals whom I met on the campaign trail. As you all know, we put 15,000 miles on my mother-in-law's Buick. I had real conversations with thousands and thousands of individuals who told me they were supporting me because they did not know how I was going to rule on cases, that they knew that I would apply the law to the facts and that I would be independent and impartial. That was the commitment I made to all the voters of the state in December when I announced, and that's the commitment that I made to them throughout the course of my campaign. What are your thoughts on declaring victory without the Government Accountability Board even declaring that you are the victor? Well, right, there is a process to be followed through the canvassing that will certify the results that we just learned about today, and I am confident that the GAB will certify the numbers that we all have in front of us now. Have what? you hired a team of lawyers, as we've heard that uh, Justice Prosser has done? We have not. Are you considering an Jane um, hiring Nate Elias? We, a consideration if you do? We have... We are, have not hired any lawyers right now. We are enjoying our victory. We, I am aware that there is a process for a recount, um, and that's certainly Justice Prosser's prerog prerogative to use that process. And what? we will respond what, as appropriate. What would happen if, if during the canvassing and in the certification that the vote flips around and uh, Justice Prosser wins, would you then seek to challenge that? Well, I won't speculate. You know, we've won right now, and we're pleased with our victory. Why did you not denounce an ad saying that Justice Prosser was weak on a case involving the sexual abuse of two boys that the victim in that case later came back to say and appear in a television ad on the justice's behalf saying that the ad was misleading and false? You know, there were attack ads on both sides. There were ads attacking me, and there were ads attacking Prosser. And I told all the people I met with from the start in January that these attack ads would come and that they needed to base their decisions on what they were hearing directly from the candidates in our campaigns and not on these third-party ads. And I was not focused that, that what was in the third-party ads, attacking me as well as, as attacking Justice Prosser, was not what this campaign was about, was not the conversation I was having pe with people. People wanted to know how they could be confident that the court would be independent and impartial, and that's the conversation I had with them. That's what this campaign and this election was all about, restoring their confidence in the independence and impartiality of the court. That was the commitment I made to all the voters of the state. That ad that was running on behalf of Justice Prosser with the abuse victim, though, was clearly very powerful. Do you think it would have taken till today for you to be able to say you won if that ad hadn't run? Do you think if it had not run, maybe you might have enjoyed a wider margin of support? I believe that I won because of the message that I got out to voters around the state, and that's what they told me. They wanted to talk about the independence and impartiality of the court, not these attacks that distorted all of our records. This, this campaign was not about the attack ads. It was about restoring people's confidence in the court. It was about my commitment that did not change from the day I announced in December 
that I would be independent and impartial. Well, how about whether it was it was, was it have to do with those issues, or did it deal more with uh, Governor Walker's um, agenda since he had um, since he's taken office? As I've said many times. All of the politicking and partisanship that took place in the executive and legislative branches over the last month only underscored for people how important it is that the, the court be independent and impartial. My message did not change. The conversation I had with voters around the state did not change. Rather, they came up to me after every event, and I did meet with thousands of people around the state, and they said they were supporting me precisely because I was committed to being independent and impartial. I had not prejudged any matters that would likely come before the court. I had not stated my positions on any of the issues roiling about in the executive and, exec and legislative branches. Joanne, given that uh, Justice Prosser is pretty well known in Wisconsin, he was a, a legislative leader for a while, he was a, an elected official in the Fox Valley, and then a sitting Supreme, Co uh, Supreme Court Justice for over a decade. What do you make of the fact that you, as a political newcomer to this type of a race, were able to defeat him? Well, I'm pretty well known, too, now. And I, <laughs> and my message resonated with people. And you can tell from, from tracking my campaign, they were, their confidence in the court had eroded from the way past elections had been run and from what they had seen of partisanship and distractions of personalities on the court. And they saw from my record at the Department of Justice and from my campaign that I would be independent and impartial. I would help move the court forward away from partisanship and away from personal quarrels. We talked to one Republican senator today who indicated he felt that if you uh, won this race, uh, as you say you've done, that that would be a bad thing for the state of Wisconsin. And he believed that that would undermine some of the work that the legislature is trying to do right now in terms of a Republican agenda. Do you buy that and do comments like that undermine the integrity of the court? Well, he hasn't heard my message. My message has crossed all political lines and was directed to all voters of the state, regardless where they fell on the political spectrum. I'm not there to approach cases by looking for an outcome that will favor either political party. I'm not there to join any block on the court. I'm there to be one of seven justices of a collective entity that decides cases on the law and the facts, free of partisanship, free of political or personal bias. Have you talked to any of your fellow justices today? No. I, I still have a case pending before the court, and so I would not do that. So how do you plan to handle that then moving forward? Will you at some point remove yourself from that current case? Right. That it's up on a request for a petition for review on the other side that had lost. and. If that case were to come before the court, of course I would recuse myself because I had been the advocate in that case. Again, just to go back to the beginning, you're confident that the 204 vote margin will hold up. Is that correct? Oh, yes. I am so pleased to have won this race. My supporters are ecstatic, and we are confident that the victory will hold. And if, you, if, if it did change, you're saying it's premature at this point to say whether you would take any steps to challenge that the vote? Right, right now we're sitting on um, on a victory. Governor Walker said that you won because of Madison. It showed that there was a the world of Madison and the rest of the state. How do you respond to that? Well, I'm really pleased by the broad statewide support that I earned in this election. And I'll stop there. <laughs> what do you think it says about Wisconsin politics right now that the vote is so close? Okay, I gotta go get up one. I think it says that we enjoy a healthy exchange of ideas in this state and a healthy democracy with a little d, and that more that most people, though, want to make sure that our court is truly independent and are impartial, and so they voted for me. And do you feel for good or ill that this election was, in fact, a referendum on the policies of Governor Scott Walker? No, I don't think it was a referendum at all on Governor Walker's policies. Indeed, as I've said before, it's, it's the, the, pol the policy making is taking place where it belongs in the legislative and executive branches. And people just wanted to make sure that that partisanship and that policy making and that politicking did not cross over into the court. And I was the candidate who, from the start, 
presented myself as the independent and impartial candidate in this race, and that's what people in Wisconsin want. At the same time, a lot of uh, voters in Wisconsin saw this as a referendum against the governor's collective bargaining legislation, and that support elevated this race to a much broader status than it might have been. It's going to be very quiet races. Do you feel that the collective bargaining issue did elevate both your status and the race overall? People tell me that they, are, they supported me and they voted for me because I pledged to be independent and impartial, and that's what they wanted on the court. They were not voting for me because I had already decided issues related to the collective bargaining or any other issue that might before the, come before the court. All of the heightened um, politicking and exchange of ideas and political disagreements that took place in the legislative and executive branches over the last month did underscore for people how important it was to have an independent and impartial court, and that's why they voted for me. So Joanne, what will you do now moving forward? It sounds like you're under the understanding that you've won, so what does this next transition look like for you? How long will you stay with the Department of Justice? Will you even resign before the results are certified at the Department of Justice to make your, your next steps in the transition process? I'm going to go back to work until I join the court in, in August. And you plan, to, uh, you plan to give notice to the Department of Justice that you will be leaving uh, until those results are certified, or are you kind of holding off to let that process play out before you decide your next steps? I'm going back to work, and I will work until I join the court in August. You said a few questions ago, my message resonated with people, and confidence in court has eroded. Can you expound upon what you meant by that? That the confidence in the court's independence and impartiality had eroded some from the way that prior judicial elections had been run and by what people saw as partisanship on the court and acrimony on the court. And I ran from the start to restore people's confidence in the independence and impartiality of the court, that I would be independent and impartial, and that I would help um, move the court away from the distractions of partisanship and personalities uh, that, that people had been seeing on the court. Have you heard from J.B. Van Hollen, your boss over at the Department of Justice? No. Do you plan to go and have a conversation with him now that you've been elected to this position in your understanding? I have had conversations with, um, the, we call it the front office, I've had conversations with my administration and I will continue to as I always have. Else? Joanne, do you think that uh, races for the Supreme Court are moving uh, more, are trending to be more political, more partisan than they have in the past? And, and if so, does that affect not just the way the court conducts itself, but the way judges seek to run for office. Well, you know, the, the public financing <coughs> that applied to this race really helped move judicial elections away from partisanship and was a really good for, first step in improving the quality of judicial <coughs> elections. We clearly still have a ways to go to figure out how to get a handle on, um, on third party ads. But for, for the bulk of this election, the candidates were having real conversations with real people about our qualifications, our backgrounds, and our approaches to the job, and how they differed from each other. We had more debates than I believe judicial candidates have had before. The voters were able to be better and more informed because we were able to have more conversations with them, and we had more debates. So they we're able to make more informed decisions, and I think that improved the quality of this election. And I do, I do believe it enabled them to um, withstand the impact of the third party ads and make their decisions <laughs> based on what they were learning directly from us in our campaigns. Joanne, how do you feel about the way the media has treated you throughout your campaign? Oh, I love it. I. Um, I respect everyone I encounter, both you know, professionally and I have in this election, and I believe I've earned the respect of everyone who's encountered me. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>
Thank you for making it more photogenic. I love you even more.